The video game industry at times is pretty depressing, all things considered. I'm not talking about the video games themselves, of course they're sad video games, but rather the means about how they're made. Deception, greed, manipulation, outright lying. A lot of companies have forgotten and or openly willingly choose to do everything in their power in the pursuit of the almighty dollar. To a degree they have to, all companies need money, but it's hard to justify the means they apparently need to go to at times. For a lot of the current generation of up-and-coming gamers, the thought of a video game not having anything else to buy after its completion is becoming more and more foreign. However, much of the older generation of gamers remembers a simpler time, when a gamer could simply get a finished product of a game. No microtransactions, no on-the-disc DLC, no day one patches, no bullshit. Just buy a game and be done. Now that isn't inherently a bad thing, and I will do another video on that another time, but games like that are just becoming a rarity now that rather than being a commonplace thing nowadays. It's becoming harder and harder to see when in the industry and how and everything went so wrong. That said, that isn't the focus of today's video. Instead, I want to bring a more somber note, to remember the life and times of someone important to all gamers out there, whether they know it or not. To remember someone who, even on his final days on this planet, cared so much about video games and gamers who played them that he continued to work on them even on his deathbed who since coming into the industry cared more about the raw entertainment of video games and bringing everyone to enjoy them and what it could do for people, more so than the dollar. This video is about Satoru Iwata, and this is a thank you for everything he did. Satoru Iwata started making video games rather young. It was in his junior year of high school at the age of 16 he made his first games on his school's calculators for him and his schoolmates to share. Remember those TI calculators you had when you were younger and played on when the teacher wasn't looking? Same concept. A couple of years later, after being accepted into the Tokyo Institute of Technology, his studies would continue into computer science, where his teacher noted his skills in programming being able to write, compile, and compress code far more efficiently than his fellow students. During his time, he worked as an intern at the Commodore branch of Japan on an attempt to get more acclimated to the technology that couldn't be easily known to the public. At this time, him and his friends would rent an apartment simply for the sake of making video games, and in 1980, after showing off some of his games, he was noticed and asked to work in one of the two companies he's most well known for in his history, HAL Laboratory. After graduating college in 1982, he would go on to work at HAL Laboratories full time as the company's only programmer. In 1983, after being appointed the coordinator of software production, he was able to strike a licensing deal with Nintendo with the first game being made under the partnership being a port of the arcade game Joust. It was his foolishness that made him leap at the chances that many other programmers declined due to a perceived difficulty or outright impossibility. But not only did he meet these challenges, he would dumbfound others with his ability to create data compression methods to fit massive amounts of sizes for the time, of course, on cartridges that many didn't expect to be possible. He worked tirelessly not only out of the means for doing his job or adoration, but because of his passion for the field. However, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, and Howe was actually on the downswing, being several billion dollars in debt after overcompensating and thinking their games would sell better. It wasn't until 1993, on the assistance of the then Nintendo president, that Iwata was promoted to the president of HAL. In the six years under his leadership, Iwata was able to alleviate the company from its debt. It was his success during that time that would eventually have him moved up to being president of Nintendo in 2002. All of this is common knowledge and most considerably we looked up on a wiki, but what's, what's less known is his work on some other Nintendo titles even while working at HAL. Pokemon Gold and Silver was set to be the final games in the Pokemon series, and they wanted to go out with a bang. They wanted to include not only a brand new generation, but the original one as well. Much like before, the thought of putting so much on unlimited space was unfathomable. But again, Iwata would come in and fix the problem making that dream a reality. He also worked in the original Pokemon Red and Green, as well as porting the original battle system to Pokemon Stadium in a week. It was also under his presidency that he developed the idea of bringing Pokemon to the West. His work on Pokemon was so prominent that in the latter Pokemon games, his work was directly referenced in-game in honor of everything he did. You know Super Smash Bros? Awada played large parts in both Original and Melee. While with Sakurai's idea to put Nintendo characters into the game to help bolster its fame, the idea was originally shot down by Nintendo, to 
which Iwata suggested behind their back for Sakurai to put them in anyway, to showcase as a demo. 20 years later, we can see the success that idea had. Iwata also worked directly on Melee, even though at that point he had moved on to being the president of Nintendo at the time. I can go on and on talking about his achievements at the company, but that isn't really the point I want to be getting across here. I want to talk about why he was so influential and so well received during his time. After becoming president of Nintendo in 2002, one of the first things he did was bring all the employees together and ask about their ideas for the future. The former president had a more standoffish approach, so this came as a surprise to everyone, but that rallying of new ideas was just the first push of Iwata's appreciation for his company as well as the employees' thoughts. A year later in 2003, he would push for a new initiative. He looked upon the success of other consoles and how they pushed a concept of graphical power over performance and turned away from it, citing his A Blue Ocean strategy where instead of beating the competition with more power, he would create a space and area where everyone could enjoy video games. The Nintendo DS and the Wii were both created with this mindset in mind. They used enjoyment rather than power. The Wii, while lacking power-wise, heavily made up for its lack of that with a more universal title approach. Something that a family could sit down and enjoy and play more so than anything else. The DS followed that same moniker boasting the touchscreen again for a sake of enjoyment that any and everyone could pick up and play and have fun with rather than just a gaming market. He was always pushing a thought of enjoyment of video games for everyone rather than just one subsidiary. That isn't to say everything during Iwata's tenure was perfect. During 2010 to 2014, the company was seeing its first losses in revenue since 2002. Iwata continued to push for gameplay enjoyment as reading several situations about the video game market causing the net failure of both the 3DS and the Wii U, compared to the predecessors anyway. While the 3DS has since done quite a good job recovering, its sales have still been lagging behind its predecessor, while the Wii U being one of their lowest selling consoles of all time. Side note for that one, I can personally attest to this one during my time working at GameStop. I lost count of the number of parents who came in thinking the Wii and the Wii U were interchangeable, and the confusions the naming convention caused. But back on topic. There is one high note for all of this though, or at least a high moral note. At times like this, most other companies would have liquidated entire sections of their company to make up for lost profit. We have examples of this today with EA devouring and shitting out companies husk in droves for a showcase of that. Iwata, however, caring far too much for his company and his employees instead took a massive 50% pay cut to make sure the company continued onward and as a showcase of good faith in what he believed in. Even through the darkest times, Iwata continued to always look for means to bring enjoyment in video games to people. Some of his last acts before his death were spearheading the development of the Switch, which has since put Nintendo back on the positive end, as well as personally worked on Pokemon Go. You can say a lot about this game, not all good, but no one can deny that no other game in history has had people up and moving around together. On the Google Play Store alone, it has 100 million registered downloads. Not for a single moment during his career did Iwata pause to think about his own wallet. Everything he did was for the sake of fun, of bringing the joyous times where you sat down with your family and friends to have a wonderful experience through the power of video games. I don't think we'll ever have someone quite like him ever again, but from the bottom of my heart, I'm sure a lot of people agree with this, I simply want to say thank you, Mr. Iwata. Your legacy will never be forgotten, and you will always stand as a shining bastion to represent the concept of video games in their purest form.